So yeah, as everyone knows now, my name is Paula Turralde and I am an energy explorer, but I am also a science, science communicator and conservationist. I am a biologist and I am finishing, I think, my PhD in Costa Rica, but I am very, very into this kind of, of projects of science communication and storytelling because yeah, it's very, it's very interesting at the end the the what you what you can get from that from the people that with with the, with the ones that you shared what you know or what you want to know. So today I am going to talk about multi species at, at, uh, as Jen said. But ah uh, yeah, I am from Ecuador. This is a small country in, in in it's in South America. That is just the profile of 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 Ecuador. So the other day I was doing nothing, I guess. And I found this meme that I found very interesting. That is like, what if the spider you killed in your home had spent his entire life thinking that you were his everything about it? No, you're only thinking about yourself. And I think it's very interesting to share this because it's basically the kind, the, it's kind of a way that we think yeah. about the world, that we think that we are the only species, the only important species, and we have shaped our world with this idea of every convenient for us as humans but we haven't realized that we that the, the, every species in the world is there for something and it, it has a role so it's not that is if it's beneficial for us we can keep it and it's if it's not then just kill it out and this multi-species approach or, or this multi-species um idea is that we are part of this world, but we are, are as, as humans, but there are all this range of different species of non-human animals, and many, maybe not, not only animals, but different kinds of species that are part of this world. And talking about spiders, talking about the spiders, uh, it's kind of a good example because there are almost 50,000 50, species of spiders that we already know, or the science the science that the, the academy know and have, have described, but there are 50, probably 50,000 more that are not discovered. So with, the, with, with this, what I want to tell you is that there, there is a lot of things in, around, out in that world that we just even don't know about it. And one of the ideas of the, this multi-species approach that is, that is protecting every species around is try to protect those species also that maybe we don't know yet that they exist, but they are there. So starting with virus and bacteria, just to have an example, there is a millions and millions and millions of species of virus and bacteria. And sometimes we think that they are bad for us, only bad for us. Virus, like we know that COVID or bacteria, whatever bacteria you think about it, we always think about them like something that is that is not good for us, that is that are like that we have to fear about. But we don't think about like the many, many of, of species of virus and bacteria that are part of us inside of our body, actually the, the bacteria and virus that we have inside our body that is basic that, that basically are helping us to survive. They shape the world that the way we know, and there will be no world, no world in the way we know it without virus and bacteria. So then let's go to this picture here that I took, I think in Costa Rica. And the idea of that, of this idea that we share our existence with millions of millions of non-human species. And I would like to ask you, and maybe you just think about any, any number that you might, you can imagine how many spe species would, be, would we be able to find in this place, in a place like this one. And I think we, I, at least me, I cannot even imagine like the amount of species that we will find in a place like like this one, and all the species that maybe we don't even they are not even described described for for science. So this idea of like trying to think about like that we are surrounded by many many species. But then then I want to also like humans here we have a very important um, role I would say because. We have the potential to hold this political power because of the ways that they they they, we, they shape the human world. So they 
So they can be regarded as a bias in, frame, in the framework, the idea that we as humans can do something to, to, to recover this concept of, multi, of, of the, of the multi-species approach. Um, and I would like to use this these drawing from Paula Teran, a friend of mine, that she's like, we humans, we can just open our windows to the world and start le learning about what we have outside. And then I can also uh, give you this, this example of, it has been a lot of, uh, a couple of years, I guess, but it's it was also recently that a group of people was actually trying to to include the the, the mushrooms, the fungi, into the the biodiversity, um, in a, into a biodiversity approach because we have think always about fauna and flora, but then we haven't think about the fungi, and there is a lot of species, many many thousand millions of species of fungi are outside, and they are very very important in the in the, in 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 our in our in our world. All the all the roles that they have in the forest are basically essential to have the to to have the forest the way we know. And one of the of the persons that were involved was involved in that is Juliana Forti, and she's from Chile, and she's she was one of the 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 persons that were with the idea of add this third F for bio for biodiversity approaches. So let like, just to think about like when we are telling a story, when we are talking about biodiversity, how can we get the message to the message to the people? It's not only the mammals, the big mammals that are interesting, but there is a lot of like insects and fungi and and virus that maybe we won't be able to take any picture about it, the the virus, of course, but they are there always, probably inside the insects that we. That we that we find there, and they are basically alive thanks thanks to this virus. And then I also want I wanted to at the, at the beginning I wanted to start when I said that I'm from Ecuador, I wanted to to show this picture because I I think I am I am very happy because like a couple of weeks ago, the sixty percent of the people in Ecuador voted to leave fossil fuels on the ground in one of the of the of the exploration um, places, not in the whole Ecuador, but I think it was very important, and I, I, I and I show these these you an ex as an, an as an example because this is the power of the people here. Like we can, if, if we join, like we can, we we have the power to have these kind of decisions to protect nature. And actually, in in a, a two weeks, two two months ago, more or less, I was, um, I was organizing a course that was that called living through fossil fuels underground and how what what is the importance of stop stop this exploration to protect nature because we depend on nature and of course I want to to, to um, show here the picture from the mountain in the mountain in Kimo that is one of the what from the Warani community in Ecuador and she's very active in this in these projects to protect the Amazon from oil exploration and exploitation. So then I want to show again this picture from my friend Paula Teran, because uh, like it is like um, a moral and political obligation for the basis institution society to take those interests into account when making decisions. With this idea of that that we that we can make can can have the power to to decide these kind of things. And to show when when you when we talk about biodiversity and when we talk about what we found, don't don't forget any of the non-human species, but don't forget the human species either because we are part of this interaction. And it's when 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 we understand that we are part of this um of, of this world of, of different species, but not as as a side species that we think that yeah, like we are or better or whatever, but we are not as, aside from this group of species we are we are with them so non-human species cannot be dismissed, dismissed because simply because they are inconvenient or costly in this kind of example like if if that if that i don't if, if that doesn't have any um um 
is not good for me in 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 some way, then I can dismiss that that species. And it's not the way because was, as I, as I was saying, like every species has a role and is important for the environment to have the environment the way we know and the ecosystems the way we know they are. And we cannot like exploit nature from the benefit benefit of just us and eliminate all this diversity here just because we think that, for example, in the case of, of, of the oil exploitation, it's better for us in economical way. So what what is the 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 the, the message here is like even if it, if it if it could be for Ecuador kind of problematic in an economical way, we cannot keep exploiting the nature in that way. So change the path and change many things with with that, but protect the virus the virus. Just for you to know, Paula. Have. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you. You're over the ten minutes. Just yeah, for you to know. I'm all almost done. done there so yeah so again like this multi-species thinking that intends to overcome the anthropocentrism and think about like uh, with non-humans and non and, and with humans and non-human others as as one and then um that we need all these species for a healthy and functioning environment every every species around and up the relationship that nourish and, and sustain us as the way, but we can also like I mean we can also nourish and sustain these species that we are very that they that are beneficial for us because they are nourishing our environment. But we can also do the same for them. And just mention two persons that I think that are important. One is uh, Lynn Margulis, that that thought about evolution as a cooperation. Uh, process like in which every every species is in is involved and then Donna Haraway would would say like build that we have to build collaborative collaborative relationships with other species because we are part of this. And this is exactly what the home river viability is like go there as humans and try to understand what is around there and live with nature, cohabitate with them, with nature and try to use these 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 results that we will have from the bioblitz to show the people all the biodiversity that we depend on. And that's it. Thanks, Paula. And thanks also for sharing with us the, the news on this uh, stop oiling drilling in uh, Ecuador. Congratulations for that, for your uh, on uh, the whole community of your country. Um, if there are any questions on Paula's um, presentation, feel free to write them down or ask, uh, at the uh, at the end of the the session after Srishti and me present. And now Srishti Vajpayee is going to present about river rights, social environmental justice. Uh, she is also a colleague of mine. We have worked together in a different communication uh, articles about river rights. And I really admire the work she has been doing in India and all around the world. So I'm proud to have her here. And you may share your screen if you want, uh, Trishti, your presentation. Thanks, Jens. And um, can you see this full screen? OK, great. Yeah. Um, so it's really nice to go after Paula because she has laid the foundation of the points that now I want to mention in context of this emerging movement of rights of nature across the world. Um, and so in the next 10 minutes, which is really um, short time to talk about this complex subject, I'll try my best um, to uh, bring out some key aspects of this whole movement. What does it really mean? And what it means also uh, beyond thinking about uh, in and within the rights framework. So uh, let me first start because this is kind of a storytelling session. So let me start with this um short um anecdote um not a full story but an anecdote of um some of us were sitting along the river indus um in the trans himalayan landscape uh, in india and talking about the rights of river indus and so um i was asking these kids of what do they think that the river that they live along with 
um, what are our rights? If you and I have a right to live, so what does it mean for the river? And interestingly, they said that the river um, has a right to sing. And I was quite amazed to hear that um, because it was indicated that only the kids uh, and people living along a river, knowing the river, dependent on the river, uh, would know what it really mean um, for the river to sing. Because then it actually means that the river should have a necessary um, water to be able to make the sounds um, for it to be able to sing. So it reminds us of um, that I want to ground when we are talking about this conversation on uh, rights of rivers, that it is really about how we how we relate with the river. How do we relate uh, with the mountain? How do we relate with the forest? And it's um, uh, much more than the legal terms or the legal aspects of it or just scientific aspects of it. Um, and so as I was saying that the river has a right to sing, to play, to flow and to live. Um, and these are the rights that in many ways um, are also very fundamental to our existence. And so does for the rest of the species. And this is the picture of the river Indus in that trans Himalayan landscape. This river flows through India, China, and Pakistan. So um, a magnificent river, which was also um, a space for uh, earliest human civilizations, which is the Indus Valley civilization. I want to remind us of what it really means in terms of our language itself, because the way we tell our stories and the way dominant narratives have been formed, it's because the language, both English and Spanish, which is what we are using at the moment, have lost the sense of animistic aliveness of nature. So, for example, in this northeastern state of India, um, the jungle is known as the forest is known as a hagra, which basically means lands land that's an elder. So you treat a land, a forest uh, as an elder, a space for wisdom and knowledge. So you would not exploit it because you already know that this land is, uh, that it has been there before the humans arrived. And in fact, for the Dimasa people, it means that they are the sons and daughters of a big river. So what I'm trying to highlight with this anecdote and example is that how our sense of everyday existence has lost the connection with nature. Where do we all come from? Who are the landscapes that inform our existence, that make us? And that sense of embodiment is lost in the modern life and modern existence. River carries us stories of origin. If you block them, you block our stories. And this is something that um, a Lepcha community woman told us uh, in the Northeast India who are resisting against a mega dam in their river. And so when they say that the river carries us stories of origin, it's because the Lepchas of where they came from and who they are and where do they go after um, their death is all defined by this river Zongu. So if you dam the river Zongu, it won't be able to tell the stories of Lepchas itself. And the tragedy of modern life is that we have lost this connection to our landscapes. We have lost this connection to our rivers. Um, this very important movements, uh, and this is relevant in context of the uh, of India, but uh, why I want to highlight that is because also the example that Paula mentioned from Ecuador, what these examples are highlighting is that when people stand up, when people stand for resistance, when people say that, no, you cannot dam this river because for you, it might be a mega what, but for us, she's our mother. Um, she carries our stories. Then that's when the change happens. That's when um, things move and legal and policy aspects are, of course, important, but it is really the people's movement and resistance that can lead to changes and uh transformations. This is a picture that I'm sharing you from, um, from my city where I'm right now, where community people in the city have been protested again, protesting against a, um, a large uh, um, road project that is coming and planning to destroy this forest that is in the middle of the city. And people uh, in the city argued that the forest has a right to live and so do we and that separation as Paula was also saying that artificial separation that the modern life has created between humans and rest of nature is also being questioned in cities as well and so it brings us to the point of um, 
why this destruction is happening. When the river, like I was mentioning during the introduction, the river Ganga is sacred to so many communities. She's a goddess, yet she is being polluted, damned, um, and all possible ways that we can desecrate her, we are doing it. So why why this, why this uh, hypocrisy in human existence? And it brings us to the question of the conflict of the sacred and the secular. Are these two separate? Are these two together? And it's a complex topic, of course, so I won't get into, but I would like uh, some of you to guess what this foam is actually that you see on the screen. Can anybody think about what it is? Soap? Yes, it is. So you see this man, um, it's actually not just soap, um, it's soap. And it's chemical pollutants from the nearby industries in the city of Delhi. This is Yamuna River. And it is also one of the sacred rivers in India. And so you see the irony of our existence. We are in this river praying for, uh, praying that she absolve all our sins, but we are actually polluting it with as much pollution we can do. So now with this context and with this kind of um, um, articulation in mind, why do we are talking about rights of nature uh, and what, what has happened is with the current laws and policies that instead of actually protecting nature, they have destroyed and has been used as a means to sanction destruction. And I don't have to emphasize enough of the current ecological crisis that we are facing, that we need to fundamentally change the systems. It's also about the kind of legal systems we have that have been anthropocentric and focused on human development, on human progress, and have actually in uh, um, have actually been based on an extractive and colonial mindset of looking rest of nature as a property or a resource to be uh, exploited. And some of the examples that I gave you in earlier slides are talking about how communities have actually lived along the rest of nature with a sense of reciprocity, interdependence, and a celebration of different worldviews and diversity of life. And so the rights of nature movement, which is emerging worldwide, uh, of course, started with the Ecuadorian um, change in the constitution, then in the US, um, some amazing stuff happening across the world. Um, uh, in New Zealand, which was an important uh, act that was passed called the Tivia Batupa, where the indigenous uh, Maori people uh, stressed on their connection with the river Wang Wangui as a river uh, living being. And then in Chile, there was uh, um, there was a process uh, to actually get rights of nature recognized. Um, but maybe colleagues from there can highlight of how that went. Um, but there's there's a lot happening, um, and there are some broader approaches that we can put all of this into. There's earth centered governance that is talking about rethinking of the, our governance paradigms uh, themselves as to how they can have more than human embedded in this uh, articulation. There's, of course, our constitutional approach, which Ecuadorian example is a very interesting one. There's, of course, indigenous communities and relational approach, that is, where communities themselves are actually putting forward ordinances or statements um, arguing for rights of nature. And then, of course, there's a judicial approach where court of law passes certain judgments. Um, I won't get into the details of many of these examples, which are very interesting to look at. Uh, the TV Tupa one uh, talked about legal personhood, where they said, we are the river and the river is us. Um, there's Aturatu River in Colombia, where they spoke about uh, protection and conservation and maintenance. It was not really legal personhood, but biocultural rights. And then, of course, Ecuador, where... Um, this whole process of bringing together the Indian indigenous concept. Um, but the Ecuadorian example is an interesting one to look at, especially because it was conflicted with the kind of growth model the state adopted, which was not really in line with the rights of nature. But this is something that maybe we reflect on later with questions. But largely the rights of nature movement is speaking of moving towards this triangle where man is on the top, not really the woman also, a man is on the top and controlling um, and uh, stressing on the existence and importance of one species over the others. Whereas this kind of is talking that we are very much part and living in a relational ecosystems. And so what is rights of rivers? And I'm specifically focusing on rivers because this is bio blitz and we are focusing on rivers. 
it's of course these many aspects of right to flow to meander as well because a lot of ways we forget that the rivers meander and to also flood its floodplains um rivers have a right to flood as well it's also about right to soil and groundwater to flow it is right to determine um, all the aspects that make a river healthy. It's about uh, rights of uh, river basin, catchment areas, and also forests near the river. Um, but as I was stressing earlier, I want to stress it further that it is not just about these legal scientific rights that the, river, uh, that the rivers have. It's also about how communities who might not be defining these rights in a very um, modern legal sense. Sorry to interrupt you, Shishti, just to let you know that you're over time, but so you can finish. But uh, no worries. Thank you so much, Jens. Yes, I'll finish this fast. Um, and the the river also has a right to flow, to play, and to feed, which is which are the kind of functions that the river perform. The river has also the right to sing. The river has a right to spirit, and uh, in which in that sense, what it means really is that that the river is not just a source of water; it is a living being. And how do we uh, revive that sense of um, of connection? And so it's also about questioning. So rights of nature is just a means towards a larger end. So we need to question um, this kind of fetishness to neoliberal growth model. It needs to question the authoritarian political governance where communities don't have the right really to um, articulate their rights. It's also questioning the legal, current legal frameworks, which is very uh, Western, in most countries, very Western um, uh, set. And so how do we move towards pluriversal legal frameworks? And it's also about questioning rights as a framework itself. Rights is going to be a means towards a larger transformations, as I was saying. And this is my li uh, last slide, and I will end after that. And sorry for going beyond time. It's really quite asking us to go beyond um, this um, Anthropocene world that we are living in. So for all of us, it's a and I believe that BioBlitz is a kind of uh, a process in that um, in that direction. That how do we find a sense of place wherever we are, wherever we live? How do we connect with our rivers and our landscapes? And how do we develop that sense of empathy and responsibility, which is not just that I have. Uh, the right to access a river water but what does it mean to be dependent on this river and what do i do and so henceforth it talks uh, or it calls for uh, radical solidarity with the people and the communities who are immediately dependent on these ecosystems but also with these uh, species who might be threatened and it also uh, then highlights that why do we need to do storytelling and that's the uh, focus also of today's session because it's an act of decolonizing. It's an act of telling stories that have not been told. It is an act of telling stories of the more than human and hence uh, respecting the diversity of multiple ways of knowing, being and doing. So thank you so much um, for your patience. And um, I hope that we get to have more conversation and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shristi. Uh, I think it's a really uh, long topic that we may keep discussing. Actually, Shristi also was part of a book which is called Pluriverse. So there are we we. I'm really grateful for her to be here because she works actually in river rights. So that is an amazing thing. We already had a multi-species biodiversity perspective from storytelling uh, by. Paula, she talked about river rights and rivers themselves. And now I'm going to talk about visionary ecologies. Uh, I'm an anthropologist and also an ecologist. And my formation is uh, between activism and also um, academics. So that will be my approach. And I will start now sharing my screen. Give me one second. Can you see this full screen? Full screen. Cool, thank you. I will start the timer. So it is year 2032. My home river, which is the Bio Bio River, is restored. After many years of discussion, finally it was granted river rights. The Bio Bio River has river rights that are enrooted in the old tradition of the Pehuenche people that consider the Bio Bio River, Rio Bio, the Bio Bio River sacred and kin to their own people. Therefore, the Bio Bio River is now a person. It has, in the Pehuenche Cosmovision, 
a sibling which is in the sky and it's called the Bueno Leofu or the river of the sky. This Bio Bio River used to have three dams, mega dams that destroy the whole river connectivity impacted on biodiversity, also on the culture of the Pehuenche and also even the Chilean that live by the river. But now these three dams are gone. Finally, we have a free flowing river from source to sea. The dam dismantling was done during the last years. And now it's a big process and long process that takes time and patience of river restoration. My own river, the home river, uh, the Bio Bio River, finally, it's free, wild and healthy river. This is one of the inhabitants that actually now I can see in front of my house. It's the torrent duck. It used to be only upstream and behind because of the three mega dams, it's kind of hard to see uh, to see it uh, in the downstream uh, during the last years. But after dismantling the three mega dams, we finally can see the torrent duck. So it's a story of river restoration, of river justice that really inspires me. But that's not the truth. <laughs> the, the present time is that we have three mega dams. Actually, they were built during the 90s and the, and the 2000s. They were built even against the local opposition of Pehuenche people. They destroyed the river, they destroyed Pehuenche Cosmovision, they destroyed my home river, which is the Bio Bio River. This is actually the dam that's still there, three mega dams, and they are still trying to construct even more dams. So that is nowadays prison narrative. And what I told you, it's a dream. It's a vision. And now I come, what are visionary ecologies? So visionary ecologies, or the term, proposes practices of speculating possible environmental relationships through what we offer to ecological visions or fiction. It's basically a game, a string game, like Donna Haraway will say. The visions that work intentionally towards liberation and alternative features of justice, environmental justice, social justice, river justice. These visions may be presented through books, comics, films, artworks, any creative work, even now a story that I just told you spontaneously, to critically inspect the relationship between the human and the ecological interactions with our more than human world. It's important for us, for our understanding, to differentiate visionary fiction from traditional fiction or science fiction, because in science fiction, you have so much possibilities. But in visionary fiction, particularly, you construct walls of liberation and justice from the dominant strains of science fiction that are based sometimes in capitalism, the patriarchy, um, extractivism, and so on. So we are aware of those narratives. and. Aware of those, we try to shift from those to other ones that reinforce a more collaborative la, based on symbiosis, like Paula was telling us, and also based on rivers that are able to sing on the stories that Trishti was telling us, more than this anthropocentric uh, colonial narratives of power. Like, um, an, uh, like a BIPOC activist in LGBTQ plus says, Adrienne Marie Brown, visionary fiction encompasses all of the fantastic with the art always bending toward justice. It's not, it, not, it is not what must be done, it's a possibility. Um, the importance of these fictions are like, it's not only who we are, it's not only the past, and it's not only shaped by our past and history, which are really big and important part, parts of ourselves and our communities. But it's also shaped on how we envision this common future that we collectively decide to build. For example, which future do we see all together here around rivers? So we shift from a mutual support to mutual care, from collaboration to radical care. This is a really nice quote from, that for me is very important uh, from Donna Haraway, which is, it matters what matters we used to think other matters with. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what knots, not knots, what thoughts, think thoughts, what descriptions, describe descriptions, what ties, tie ties. It's a, it matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. It matters what are we speaking about, how are we speaking about that. In that sense, just as a tiny uh, review on uh, science fiction and visionary fictions, we have these typical big uh, books like 1984 by George Orwell or Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, normally written in science fiction by white men from the Northern Hemisphere. And they tend to talk about a post-apocalyptic world that is ruled, still ruled by capitalism, by competition, by control, by dominance, and so on. These are really interesting works, but normally they bend 
toward control and a fatal ending. Post-apocalyptic dystopies are they called, like dystopian uh, worlds. There are other narratives that I also like to encourage to and also to give space. For example, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind from Hayao Miyazaki. It's a post-apocalyptic world, but in this world, there is a, a female protagonist that understood the interconnections of the forest, insects, other animals, and humanity. And, and she herself starts uh, to work towards bringing justice, to protect, even after a post-apocalyptic uh, event, to protect the forest, which is considered poisonous. She understands the forest is actually healing the earth and so on. So it's an inter I really recommend you that movie. I love it. It's really nice. I bet many of you have seen it. And there's also another movie from uh, Hayao Miyazaki, which is called Princess Mononoke. It's also similar. It's also a struggle between humanity, uh, resource extractivism, and also Mononoke herself, who lives with the wolves and the nature spirits. And somehow this struggle represents now the modernity struggle we encounter in so many places and around so many rivers. There are also really nice books like Ursula Lewin, The World for World is Forest, or A Psalm for the Wild Build by Becky Chambers, which is a monk that actually learns how to live in the wild, uh, taught by a robot, and so on. So basically there are so many stories, though so many possibilities that are dream, dreaming collectively on different features that are not only based on dystopia, or not even on utopian features, because utopy sometimes is unreachable. These features that are, for example, shown in the, these movies, or in these books are many times uh, not easy. They are not solved. It's not that everything is perfect. There is still a struggle, there is suffering, but this struggle tends and bends toward justice and multi-species uh, caring. And now I have a little story as well, which is the story of the, the banner we have. I think you have read it in several times. It's based on the, uh, um, the Garden of Early Delights. And in a way, it's also interesting to see how we can inspire each other using arts, paintings, and so on. And this, uh, this painting you see here, it was the one that Mauro, or the illustrator, used to create this one, where you can see the three rivers and people um, also co co collaborating, so, uh, observing nature, and being part of it. So I think it's really interesting how Mauro used as a reference in the, the Garden of Early Delights. I will jump this part, skip it, and just say, that for me, at least on visionary fiction and this home river bio blitz, it's about this session, like not only science, which is very important, but on asking ourselves, what is, what is bringing us together? Why are we actually going out for several days, being now in front of a computer when I could be doing anything else so, and volunteering for this type of project? So what are we aiming for? Which world do we want to create when we go out and we interact with other more than human beings? And I think for me, at least, this quote is que really clear on this. We need stories of victory. We need stories of transformative imagination and wild adventure that somehow succeed against the odds. And I think that's the Home River Bio Blitz. Nowadays, we are constantly being uh, bombarded by uh, the climate crisis news. Um, many governments are bending toward far-right extreme fascist groups. And I think it looks loom, uh, really, really catastrophic when you look at the whole big picture. So which narratives are we going to use to say we still believe in the world, we still believe in ourselves and the capacity of species, human and non-human species, to come together heal each other and be together around a river. And I think that's visionary fiction. And I think that is also really, really useful when we are telling our stories, when we're telling our story or river story or community story, the spider story or the fungi story. How do we tell the story and what do we want to tell and for whom and with whom are very important questions, which I cannot answer. Um, now I will jump. I finished my presentation, 10 minutes. Uh, and I will just open a next space. Um, but before opening that next space, I wonder if there are any questions to Paula, Shishti, or to me uh, related to the topics and terms we use. So I will stop sharing briefly my, my presentation and then we go to the uh, second part, which will be just 10 minutes of reflections because we are already almost over time. So are there any questions or comments you want to share with any of us? 
I have one. Um, I think it was for a uh, Paula. Um, when you were talking about like the amount of species that live in the river, and I, I also consider that it's unimaginable. Um, and it's like considering this com the complexity of interactions uh, between species. Do you think we can actually assess the externalities of our actions? And if not. What do you think could be a viable path for making better decisions? Um, I think we could as could can assess this externalities not for every species maybe maybe, but I don't think we should. It's that important. I mean, the most important thing here is to understand that we have an impact that we we are part of the world. So so try to change this idea of stop uh modifying nature to our to our benefit but benefit get benefit from nature but give the nature the benefits that they deserve so it's not i don't think it will be super necessary to to understand what are our our impacts but stop impacting the, the nature and start living in a in a more how do you say in a more um um with 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 this interaction with, that we are looking for, like thinking that we are really part of that. Picture. So maybe if we can uh, assess these externalities, I don't think we should just understand that we are part of nature. The benefits should be like from both sides. Thank you both. Uh, is there any other question um, related to the topics we have discussed, or else I will go and I open my presentation to ask ourselves together some questions. Okay. Then I will just share my screen. And this is the second part of our um, meeting. And this is about like, okay, so we have our home bio bits. We have spoken really nice stories about um, so, uh, multi-species river rights visions and so on so what how can this be useful or how can we use this for our own stories in the home river biopics and for that i have several like um questions or we to point to something so when we tell these stories of justice we also have to be aware of like several intersectionalities that are gender religion ethnicity queerness race ability class cisness education nationality and sexuality so then we, when we are visioning these features or telling these present stories or the past stories, how do we really consider these variables? It's not the same if I tell the story than if Paula or she, she tells the story, not only because we have different gender, but also our ethnicity is, has different backgrounds. So the, very probably we believe in different features and there are common ground that we may find. So that's a very important question to raise up. Like, who are you and what are you telling? to others and who is your community. And in that sense, the vision for an, for an environmentalist for rivers that deeply embeds equality humans must come with protection of more than humans is one vision, one that acknowledges the access relationship and health of rivers is intersected with social justice, human rights and, and, um, and discrimination, other vision. So how do we, what are we, what, what are we telling? So Paulo, for example, was really clear on telling, okay, so we believe in multi-species justice and seeing each other as part of nature. And then come the first task that uh, we could now discuss in these 10 minutes we have left. And is there are some questions that I would love to ask to you, uh, Paula and Shishti as speakers. And also if anybody else has these questions uh, in mind or have any answers, feel free to answer them. And these are like, so whose backyard I'm entering when I'm entering the river to do a home river bio blitz? Who is most impacted by the river health? Which communities? And when we think about giving space or amplify unheard voices, who has already done work here that deserves respect? Maybe we are not the first ones to do science in a place. There are many others before us and we could acknowledge their work. Who can I use actually my privilege, and I'm talking here about myself, to amplify the work that is already being done? Or what story has been erased in relationship to this river that we are forgotten? Also facilitating, so can, can we be open to feedback when we tell stories like how can people reach to us? 
And also, how can we lead others, uh, lead, lead, allow others to lead the way? Those are more practical questions. Um, I will leave here uh, these uh, open questions. So you may feel free to, to answer one of those. And I would like, love to hear Paula, Shishti, or any of you that may, may feel um, moved by these questions. Anybody? Maybe Paula? I can start with one example. When, when I read this question, that is, who is the most impacted by the river's health? I come again with this um, reality here in Ecuador that from the oil exploration and exploitation in the Amazon. And the communities that are more affected are the ones that are beside these places where the, where the explorations are take place and when expl where expl exploitation take place. And one of the things that I have realized recently, not recently, but I have realized is that in the city, we just don't know what is going on there in the Amazon. We, we really don't have any idea of what is the effect for those communities. So for the people in the city, it's really easy to say, no, we need the, the, the oil extra explore, exploitation because we need the money and that will save us forever. And we never think about like what's the real impact with for the communities, and we don't even think about it, and we don't even know about. It. So this idea of try to empathize a little bit with the people that live close to these natural environments. So rivers will be the, the example, and who is the most impacted? Probably the people that live around the river. But at the end, everyone at the end, and the at the at the end is something that is just. Um, in, in, impactful for everyone. So the thing is that is not immediately immediate for, for many people. But with, if we empathize with these people that live close to the communities, then we might be able to think about like what's the real impact of those kind those kind of actions. Extractive actions at the end, they are all the same. Like if it's oil, if it's gas, if it's dams, whatever, like it's this, at the end is the same result. Thanks, Paula, for your reflection. Shishti, do you have any uh, reflection on the questions or you want to also point out something else? Yeah, sure. Many thoughts are flowing in. Um, and I think it is uh, just building on to what Paula, pa Paula was saying, sorry, was uh, about the aspect of not knowing enough of what's around us. And I guess uh, that's the crisis of... Um, that's at the crux of a lot of ecological crisis because unless we know um, that there's a forest in the middle of city of Mumbai, unless we know that the river in our backyard, um, that there's so many species living along with us, um, we wouldn't be able to protect her um, or stand for the rights of those species. Um, and in turn, of course, uh, a lot of communities that are immediately dependent on it. And we see in the context of, say, um, especially in the Indian and um, and I can uh, say for the Southeast, a South Asian context that a lot of you see if a river is polluted, the stretches that are extremely polluted, a lot of marginalized communities, uh, especially in the uh, cities, a lot of marginalized communities live along those rivers. And they are the ones uh, bearing the brunt of a polluted river um, water that they can't drink or have access to. Um, living in shanties that um, that are very inhuman to live in. So there is a very strong sense of um, social injustice that comes with uh, being able to access these rivers as well. And in India, it is further, for example, amplified with which caste or religion you belong to, that you are not able to even access uh, certain water um, and rivers. So I think... Uh, Unless we relate with any river or any ecological species, we won't be able to uh, understand what is really impacting it. And some fantastic studies have been done on how 
even knowing about the pollution of the river, you actually connect with your own personal traumas, with your own personal uh, pollution in many ways. So it's really important for our own kathas, uh, catheteric process that we uh, relate with the ecosystems around us. And um, I just uh, very briefly would like to mention, and then I'll stop, is about this aspect of you know what history has been erased and um there are of course in various places where the history has been erased but it is also the erasure of um erasure of memory it is also the manipulation of the history um so how how we understand uh say sacredness it's completely ritualized in the modern life and so if you go um and put some flowers in the river that's it um and if you seek some blessings from a tree that's it and so you say that it is sacred, but you do nothing really for protecting it. So it's also about um, how all how the modern institutions and institutions of power are using and manipulating many of the things that the traditions have been uh, speaking to. So I think in some of those contexts, we have to also look at um, these manipulative aspects that the modern power institutions are using. Thank you. Oh, that was great um before you go kata i think your perspective on sacredness in india shishti uh it's so um contrasting to sacredness in other places because then you already have this uh statement of sacredness to the river which in many other places is not even possible but then you ask yourself okay what does it mean is it even like does it mean something and it, you just explode my mind culturally speaking like so many questions kata uh, there you go Thank you. I just want to reflect a little bit on what you presented because I think it's very important. Um, this characteristic you say, like that we have, that we define as positionality. You no, know? like who are we in front of the river or, or this community? Uh, I'm currently working in this river in the Netherlands, but I've been working in Ecuador as well with another river. And you need to be very aware of how you present yourself. Like who I am. I am a foreigner, but I'm also Latin America. I'm a woman in a community where there are women leaders or men leaders, or how do I enter a community? So I think that's very important uh, to highlight. But also in, in this second point that you say, like uh, how to give space or amplify unheard voices, sometimes silence is even more powerful because sometimes we don't need to give voice to anyone. They already have their voice and they are completely capable of defending their own territories. So I think we also need to be humble in this and learn to listen and to understand uh, how uh, are we positioned in this place and not always is to give power uh, to the unheard or the poor people. Uh, I think they also have the resources. They have all the resources, even more than us, <laughs> to be um, to make themselves heard. So I think that's uh, something important that uh, it's a big reflection in, in my own uh, research and I want to share it with you. And that was a really nice um, intervention. Um, and is there anybody, I, I think it would be interesting. We, we still have 10 minutes. If like already I talk at uh, Paula and Shishti, it would be nice to hear other people. So feel free to turn on your camera and choose one of the questions that are down in the chat and, and try to answer uh, if you want and if you're willing to. David? Yeah, thank you. Um... I will uh, go for the question, who is most impacted by this river's health? And I think uh, taking the Paula's speech, uh, the species on the river are the most impacted organisms by the uh, pollution of the rivers. And we have been uh, experienced a declination of, uh, of the population of a local um, shrimp we call uh, like uh, chacal, I don't know if uh, it's like uh, a sweet water shrimp. And we have experienced a very, very low 
uh, population since five years ago. So the, the people who live from uh, the uh, fishing them or ca uh, catching them to sell them, they don't have this income anymore till now because there's no more in the river. But beyond that, uh, we have this uh, pollution in the river that it's made from us. We have, as Claudia said, we have the uh, sugarcane industry, which is a, one of the most uh, impacted and uh, pollutant industries in Mexico. But also uh, we have the big, uh, big cities or the biggest cities in the region, which is Outland and El Grullo, which um, discharge the wastewater in the river. But sometimes we think just to um, to give this um, responsibility to the government to give treatment to the water, but it's a water that we are using. So I think the most uh, fundamental um, thing we need to to give in this storytelling uh, approach is. Uh, give people the responsibility to make actions on their own homes because the um, everything we use in home it's going to the river and that's what we are experience as the gradation of our rivers and the government yeah they have the responsibility because the law tell they have to do things but they many, many times they don't have money. And we you know there's another things that uh, are out of our control. Um, but as individuals, I think we should uh, think about our, um, the kind of items we use and uh, our purchase decisions. I think they can make a difference in our environment and also in our lives. So that's uh, kind of my reflection on this. Thank you, David, for your insightful reflection. Um, is there anybody else that would want to say something? We have around th three, four more minutes. So we would love to hear Lancy, Lanchi, how, how do I pronounce your name? Hola, Lancy. Lancy. Lancy, I'm from Mexico as, as well. I know Anja. Thank you for inviting me and David. Hi. Hey, thank you all for sharing your stories and your knowledge. It's very um um in it's in it's, it enhances my spirit to to continue the pursuit of the um, fight for the rivers right now. I I now know this term and I appreciate. Este I think uh, one of what, one thing that I think is important to to acknowledge as well is the importance to recover this um, discussion, this this kind of spaces between uh, uh, in in societies that we have lost um, these spaces where we can all say our visions and acknowledge uh, acknowledge as well the situation. I'm sorry. Sorry. Well, um, I think it's 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 an important yeah. issue to to uh, to to do to facilitate this um, this space yeah. of reflection in in our societies to because sometimes we've lost the connection in 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 such a degree that it's difficult to to, to society to see yeah. what is happening. I'm sorry. Uh, your did you turn your mic off or this has she has some problems with the dog dog's noise so that's why okay but the voice of the more than human <laughs> yeah thank you uh, Lancy and also dogs for being here with us
Uh, is there anything else you want to add? Maybe any, uh, I don't know if you have any reflection on this. I, I saw some, uh, some New York also uh, turning on uh, his camera. So I don't know if we have still more, a bit more time for one more reflection. Claudia, any? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe um, I will uh, talk about uh, the point of who has already done work here that deserves respect. Uh, more more than that, we I think we have to identify those previous works to join and to make us more strong in the objective of, of conserve rivers, of act for the river, because there are so many people who are interested in working for the rivers or interest in um, joining the, these projects. So I think it's really, really important to share the experiences and to have time to research about what has been done here. And we could just connect and make it uh, more uh, more strong. That's uh, That will be my point. Thank you, Enya. Claudia or Somniak, do you want to say something? No, sir. It's it's a great time to to share this moment with you. I got a lot of knowledge and experience from you guys of 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 all around the world. It's a nice time to join with you. Thank you, Claudia. Did you turn your camera on because you wanted to say something? Well, well, just just uh, briefly um, about the question: How can I use my privilege to amplify the work? already uh, been done. Um, I think this is also very important to take these opportunities to um, to show how some practices here uh, in our home rivers are uh, um, really not um, uh, good um, uh, managing, uh, good manage the, to the rivers. For example, dragging the, dragging the, the rivers or streams here is a very uh, common practice. And it is actually is asking for the people, for the society, uh, because they are uh, af um, afraid to be uh, flooded during the, the rainy season. So it's like um, um, the, the municipality uh, feel that this a, is a good practice to track the, the river. Um, before the rainy season start because the people ask for them. So, and, and also the um, journals, all the media are involved and, and say, oh, it's good, uh, thank you uh, to the municipality who is doing this for, for all the people. And so when we are talking about with them, what is the, the damage, uh, ecological, social, and economics of this type of manage, they are more uh, conscious that is actually is not so good practice, and but I, they didn't know about it. So I think it's also part of our responsibility um, to to show, to explain, uh, and to change the para the the paradigms they manage uh, that they are doing for very long, long time. That's what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And I think with those words, we can uh, already close the session. Thank you for your patience and for being here one hour and a half. And also for uh, your reflections. Um, like we were saying at the beginning, this is not like a toolkit necessarily, but also more of a really philosophical um, perspective from storytelling, because there are so many toolkits for storytelling, but sometimes we lack the space to talk about the stories themselves. Um, there, Lancy said that she wanted to share that is to acknowledge as well is for the importance to recover or create the spaces where society can talk about these topics and take well, take actions. Exactly what we were just saying. <laughs> Thank you, Lancy. Um, I don't know if uh, Enya has something else to say. More practical stuff. Thank you, Shishti, Paula, for your presentations. They were really nice, and everybody for being here. And I hope also to hear, see, or uh, read any of your stories uh, when they come up. If they, if 